I'm a physicist. Uh, I'm at an institute for theoretical physics in Santa Barbara, California. There's a picture of it. I'd like to tell you about something from my own research, uh, which is in theoretical biomechanics. You might say theoretical biomechanics. That sounds boring. I'd rather hear a talk on seven-dimensional polyominoes uh, and making a alphabet out of them. Uh, but uh, I want to convince you that actually there's a lot of interesting things in biomechanics, particularly if you go down to the level of cells or what's inside of cells. We heard in the last talk that virus capsids often form uh, polyhedra. That's absolutely true. In fact, if you're interested in that, you should look up the theory of Casper and Klug, uh, who are two uh, biochemists who uh, or uh, uh, biophysicist, maybe, who uh, actually uh, spelled that out in detail. I want to talk about things inside of our own cells, cells like ours, that is, cells of eukaryotes. Eukaryotes are, let's say, more advanced cells than bacteria, and certainly more advanced in a certain sense than viruses. Uh, all of your cells are eukaryotic cells. All of your cells have a gigantic membrane organelle inside of them called the endoplasmic reticulum. It's often called the ER because biologists don't want to say endoplasmic reticulum over and over again. But the basic structure of this is very complicated, in fact. It has three different morphologies. I showed two of them here. So in fact, inside of all your cells, except for a handful of uh, cell types, you have this ER. It comes in tubes, a tubular network. It's connected to a sheet-like, I'll say a sheet-like network because its topology is complex. Here's an artist's rendition. There are a lot of mysteries associated with this structure. The biologists had noted lots of things. It was discovered around 1950 or so. Uh, no one knew it was there because it's very delicate structure, but it goes at, throughout the entire cell. It does a lot of things. I won't get into it, but there were mysteries. They didn't know why the sheets seemed to be evenly uh, spaced, why there seemed to be a wavelength, let's say, describing the spacing of the sheets. Uh, the tubular structure wasn't understood, uh, and so on and so on. It's actually connected to the nucleus. The nuclear envelope for people who study the ER is just a specialized part of the ER. In fact, include, if I even, even include the outside of the cell, which is a membrane, a fluid membrane, the ER makes up 40 to 50 percent of all the membrane in the cell, including that. So it's a gigantic structure. Uh, the biologists use another terminology, rough and smooth. I won't say much about it, but rough came from electron micrographs because electron micrographs had a texture, and the texture turned out to be ribosomes. So that's one of the important functions of the ER. All of the ribosomes, well, I shouldn't say all, some of the ribosomes sit on it. Some are free floating in the cytoplasm, but the other ribosomes are bound to the endoplasmic reticulum. Ribosomes are where all the proteins are made. You wouldn't be able to pick up a pencil or look at me if you didn't have your ribosomes churning out proteins all the time. So the ER is extremely important to the cell. Well, Terasaki, uh, who's a cell biologist, and I and a group of other people collaborated some years ago, and uh, we made a discovery. We discovered that uh, there are structures inside the ER that look like very beautiful mathematical forms, and I'll get to that. This was the origin of the discovery. We had this electron microscopy data, which came from Jeff, Jeff Lichtman's lab at Harvard, and we noticed well, for instance, if you look at the right column and you go down, and then the next column, and then go down, sorry, the left. Go to the left column and then go down, then the next column, go down. You'll see one sheet. These are sheets of the ER, ER caught in cross sections, in serial cross sections. One cross section after another through a cell. One sheet bends toward the other, then there's a topological reconnection, and then that little piece bends to the next sheet, and so on. So what I'm pointing to is this, connecting there, and then disconnecting on the opposite side. Then that piece bends toward the next sheet, and then there's a looks like a three-way thing, and then a disconnection, thank you, <coughs> and so on. So, oops, I have to go back. So Terasaki and I actually 
reconstructed that out of clay, and what we found was this structure. It's a chiral structure. In the center is the edge that you just saw that bends and twists in space. In fact, when we reconstructed it in three dimensions, we found these were helices. So the thing, that structure I showed you, that chiral structure, is actually a left-handed or a right-handed helix. This explains why the sheets were evenly spaced. The spacing is just the pitch of that helical defect in the layers. So this got published uh, two and a half years ago, made the cover of Cell, which uh, actually is a big deal, though I'm a physicist, I didn't really know that. And, uh, <laughs> the, uh, and they dubbed it the parking garage model, named after those helical ramps that you find at the airport parking garages. I won't go into the mathematics of it, but we can actually show these are solutions of the elastic equations that describe a fluid membrane. So you could take a helicoid, which is a minimal surface, and actually solves that equation. And you can construct, by taking the center out of the helicoid, one of these helical ramps. So we believe, in fact, that you have pairs of helical ramps. With one left-handed and one right-handed helical ramp, you can make parallel flat sheets, just like in the parking garage structure. This actually has a lot to do with how they're formed, it turns out. But I don't have time to go into that. If you see me, just ask me about it, and I'll tell you something, a little story, not confirmed yet, about the genesis of these structures inside the cell. Thank you. <laughs>